All right, hi everyone. Today, um, welcome to our webinar on the importance of rootstock selection when growing fruit trees. Today, with me again is Joel Reich, the CSU Extension horticulturist out of Boulder County. Thanks again for joining us. You're welcome. <laughs> My name is Jennifer Cook. I'm the Small Acres Management Coordinator for the Front Range in Colorado, and I work with the CSU Extension and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the CSU Extension Small Acreage Management website. And I'll send out some announcements to let everyone know when that's available, probably by tomorrow. Um, I guess before we get started, let's bring the poll question up, if you wouldn't mind, Ruth. Ruth Wilson is um, our IT person behind the scenes. Um, and she's going to bring up our poll question. So this is just to um, rate everyone's knowledge before the presentation. And then again, we'll rate your knowledge after to sort of show the success of, of our presentation today. So hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Sound all right, Ruth? OK, good. We'll give everyone a few more seconds here to answer this. Looks like everyone that's going to answer <laughs> has answered. So we'll go ahead and um, pull up Joel's presentation. And I'll hand things over to Joel. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. And. Uh, I just want to let you guys know, I think in a moment here, Ruth will move from the live video feed of Jennifer and I to our still photo. We tried to have a little fun today. If you can't make it out, it's... Oh, oh you saw it when you came in. We were, we were dangling grapes into our mouths. Um, I know it's rootstocks, but uh, we had grapes ripe today. Anyways, uh, today, thanks for uh, joining me and uh, Jennifer for this latest session in the, in the fruit webinar series. And today, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about rootstocks and also grafting because it turns out these are often uh, topics that aren't paid a lot of attention but are really key to having the success you want to have with fruit trees. Okay, so a little bit of background so that you understand um, where we're going with, with rootstocks, okay? So first, you need to understand that just about every tree fruit you've ever eaten was grown on a tree that's been grafted. And so I'm going to talk just a little bit about the grafting process and why we graft fruit trees so that then you'll understand some of these criteria that make a particular rootstock a good one. Okay, so as you can see in the diagram and in the photo, um, a grafted tree is comprised of two components. Uh, there's the rootstock, which is basically just the roots and then a little stub of the bottom of the trunk. And then there's what we call the scion, and that is the piece of tissue, it can be a branch, it can even be a single bud, that is the variety of fruit that we want. For instance, Braeburn apple, that would be the scion, and the rootstock might be something like MM111, something strange and unrecognizable like that. And if you look at the picture to the right, um, we're actually seeing um, an image of a freshly made graft, that's actually going to be a uh, whip graft where you can see distinctly because of the different color of the bark, you can see the rootstock portion and the scion portion. And so, you know, a graft like that's going to get wrapped up, but I just wanted to show you uh, what the initial marriage of those two pieces looks like. Okay, so. Um, Pretty much all tree fruit varieties that you've ever heard of, such things like Fuji apple or navel orange or Bartlett pear, Bing cherry, when we have these names associated with a type of fruit, that is the cultivar name, and those are all clones. You cannot, for instance, take um, a seed out of a Bing cherry, germinate it, grow it into a tree, and expect to get Bing cherries off of that tree. You will not. Uh, a seed, by definition, is the result of sexual recombination. That means the genes have remixed, and the result will be something different. It will share a lot of similarities because its parent or parents were Bing, although it could have been cross-pollinated with a different type of cherry, so it might have two different parents. But regardless, any seed that you grow out from a fruit um, is not going to, as we say, quote, come true. It will not be the same variety of fruit as you ate that seed out of. Um, it, uh, it will be something different. And that's why when 
breeders develop a variety of fruit that they really like because it grows well, it tastes well, etc. Um, that's why we start to reproduce that variety from clones and that's where this grafting process comes in, okay? So when we develop these, uh, these varieties, um, either they're the result of many generations of genetic recombination, which would be what we all talk about as breeding, right? So making crosses and selecting the best out of that first cross and then making more crosses and selecting and selecting the very best. And so there's going to be many generations. One other way, um, and it's actually a pretty important way that new varieties arise, is through random mutation. Okay, so sometimes it takes decades and decades to develop a new fruit tree variety. But occasionally, we will see a random mutation that has mutated in such a way that it's uh, that that piece of tissue, that branch, okay, is making better fruit than the original fruit that the, the rest of the tree was making. Um, and we call that a sport. And I'll just tell you one story to kind of uh, help you flesh out this concept of a sport. So in Brazil, near the, the city of Bahia in northeastern Brazil, back in the early part of the 1900s, uh, lots of orange orchards down there and citrus of all sorts. And there was one orange tree in one grove that one of the the young men who worked in this this uh, orchard noticed did not make seeds at all had very very tasty juicy flesh and had this funny belly button looking kind of thing on the end of it well it turns out, at least as far as the story goes, this guy kept this one branch on this one tree secret for several years. And he would just pick all the oranges off it for his family and friends and just share them with a select few people. And some, some years down the road, word got out about this special branch. Uh, and it, you know the managers of this orchard and some horticulturists down there realized, wow, this is a genetic mutation that's created a whole new and better, more desirable orange variety. And so ever since that day, navel oranges have literally been reproduced asexually as clones that can all be, you know, the, the connection can be drawn directly back to that first branch on that one navel tree. Um, you know, in the 20s, when, when this was first kind of brought to light, they were distributed all over the world. And for instance, one of those very original cuttings that came off of this tree um, is still alive in Riverside, California at UC Riverside. They've got it in this gigantic cage to try to protect it from any kind of depredation. But uh, so that story there, though, is, is really surprisingly common. Uh, many of you may be familiar with a wine grape called Pinot Noir. It's one of my favorite red wines. Well, you may also know Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio, and those are just the French versus Italian pronunciations there. But Pinot Grigio was a naturally occurring random mutation of Pinot Noir. And a, a savvy vineyard operator noticed this one vine on one plant uh, growing these pale colored non-pigmented grapes and recognized the potential value, started taking cuttings, cloning, and the rest is history. Um, so this has come about in many, many instances. So we can either have new cultivars arise through genetic mutations that are recognized, because I got to tell you folks, there are surely lots of positive genetic mutations out there that could just go unnoticed. And you know, one season later, the, the window may have been missed and we never know about it. So anyway, so either it's going to be through these random mutations or through more traditional breeding. <clears throat> okay, so again, getting back to why we do grafting with fruit trees, okay? So once a desirable variety, which we can also refer to as a genotype, has been found, um, we want to stop all those genetic changes so that we can keep growing that fruit that we decided we liked, right? So we do not want to go back to growing from seed because we're necessarily going to get some different type of fruit on that tree and the chances frankly are extremely low that it will be better than the original parent tree generally about one in ten thousand seeds planted out from a, a, a tree that has really good fruit on it only about one in ten thousand will be an improvement over the fruit uh, that uh, that the seeds came out of so anyways, um, I would just like to tell you again, back to this breeding versus uh, mutated sport discussion, some examples 
that have come out of breeding programs that you're probably familiar with would be Honeycrisp Apple. Uh, that was the, the uh, University of Minnesota. And the Santa Rosa Plum. Santa Rosa Plum was developed by Luther Burbank. Um, then some that came about through the genetic mutation or sports, as I've mentioned, would be the Naval Orange and the Pinot Blanc Grape. Okay, so I think I've kind of covered a lot of what's, what's here on this page, but just to run over it because it is pretty important. Anytime we take a seed, okay, the seed has been the result of a flower, the ovule in a flower, and pollen from either that same flower or some different flower of a related species. Um, and so whenever that happens, we have sex. We have genetic recombination, and you're going to get something different. Um, and that is why we take clones of the vegetative tissue of the variety we like, and we reproduce those clones asexually. And of course, I love The Simpsons, so I just had to show the image there of when Homer got cloned. Okay, the next slide here. Um, <clears throat> so, as I've mentioned, these clones are made from a piece of tissue. And again, that can be a whole branch. It can be a little twig. Um, it can even be one single dormant bud. Um, so any tissue, because all of that tissue is going to have the genetic material in there for that variety we desire. Okay, And whatever that material is, we refer to that as the scion. Um, it's, a na it's a word that we use in, in the rest of our language to refer to the oldest son of a particular family, the one who's going to carry on the name of the family, the heritage and the genetic material of that family. So that's where that name scion comes from. Um, so it can be really difficult to get scions to just grow their own roots. Like say you just take a cutting, it can be really challenging to get it to grow roots. Furthermore, it turns out that the roots that would grow on a lot of these varieties that we really like, let's, you know, because you can go through some steps and you can get a cutting to, to grow its own roots, but they tend, many of the varieties that have fruit that we really like, tend to have really weak root systems. So they're, they may be sensitive to cold or heat. They may not function very effectively as a, as a way to move water into the tree. They might be very susceptible to diseases. There's a whole lot of weaknesses that we can see. And so in just the same way that um, we are selecting varieties and scion material to make us the best fruits possible, we also can select the best roots possible um, to pair with the scion variety that we like. And just to, to, to go over the pictures here on the bottom right, uh, this, uh, the picture with kind of the peachy orange background, that's showing uh, what we call a, uh, a T graft, where what you see, the larger stem there, um, has been split just down to the cambium layer, and then a small piece, what's sometimes called a bud shield, um, of the variety we want has been excised, you know, cut out with a small, sharp knife from a tree of the variety we want, and it's being just slipped right under that bark so that the cambium layers on both the shield and that larger uh, stem there are in contact. And then you wrap it with typically a rubber band or what's called grafting tape. And in a couple of weeks, generally, those two pieces heal together. And then what you're going to do is you're only going to allow growing shoots from that little bud that you just inserted, those are going to be the only shoots you're going to allow. And you'll snip off anything else that's growing out of the rootstock portion. So if you look to the picture in the very bottom right, you'll see uh, it's not actually the, the exact same one, but this would be about a month later. After doing the kind of grafting we see on the left, about a month later, you've got that bud growing all by itself. Okay, And so let's, let's uh, move on to the next slide. Okay, so uh, because so many of these cultivars that we grow that make the great fruit for us have these weak root systems, uh, for a long time, literally hundreds of years, people have been in the practice of growing out uh, batches of seedlings, just those random old seedlings that might make any old kind of fruit, we just don't know, and they will grow them out and then chop them down so they're only about two inches above the ground and add onto there a scion from a variety of apple that they like. So let's say you've got one apple tree, we'll call it variety X that you really like. You might take 500 seeds of unknown quality, 
but they're all apples, okay? You plant them out, you get let them grow for a year or two until they get uh, um, stems on them that are about as thick as uh, you know the average finger, and then you will take a bunch of cuttings from the tree you like and graft those onto what you're now calling the rootstock. That seedling, once you've cut it off, is now the rootstock, okay? So that's what people did for hundreds of years. They would just put the variety they wanted onto any old seedling rootstock. But then, as people do, uh, some people started noticing that some of those seedlings made particularly good rootstocks. And that's where uh, the whole decision and the practice in horticulture came in to not just focus on cloning uh, the, the scion varieties that we like the best, but also to start cloning the rootstocks, those seedling uh, trees that had particularly good rootstocks. Uh, and so that's when people started doing that. And that, too, happened uh, at least 200 years ago. We know of people in Europe uh, selecting rootstocks and propagating those asexually to maintain them. So let's just look at a couple more pictures here, because I think what you're going to see in these pictures is something that you recognize. You've probably seen a lot of these trees like this, and maybe not always uh, realized what that funny little scar was about. So again, you can see on the left, we've got the scion material at the top, the rootstock at the bottom, only three, maybe four inches of it sticking out above ground, and then right in the middle we've got the graft union. And um, like I showed you with that T bud graft, where you just take one bud and you put it in there, um, once that one bud takes off, you then are going to cut off the rest of the vertical shoot, the, the trunk really, of the rootstock, so that your desired scion variety is the top growing point on the tree. So when you look at these two pictures and you see that circular scar uh, where the graft union is, that scar is literally where the top of the rootstock's trunk was until it was cut off. And then you can see where the new growth, that is the new upper trunk, has emerged from just adjacent to that because that's where that one single bud was inserted. Okay, so nowadays we can reap the benefits of hundreds of years of development work on these clonal varieties of scions and rootstocks. And I just wanted to show you here, uh, the, the illustration on the, the upper left um, basically shows two years um, in the process of developing rootstocks. And, and we use a process called stool mounding. Um, so basically the first uh, illustration to the very left shows just a uh, one year old first season cutting of rootstock, growing roots there. Uh, you see it grows a bit, it goes dormant, and notice where it says uh, number three there, that rootstock has been cut right down to the ground. Then in image four, that little uh, upside down semicircle, that's supposed to indicate soil. So when you cut one of these things right to the ground, then you mound soil over it, uh, just like any shrub or tree that we prune, it's going to sprout back out with two or more uh, vegetative shoots from just below the cut. And that's exactly what happens here with these, these rootstocks. So you mound it up, it causes four, five, six, sometimes ten shoots to come out. And because the base of those shoots is underground, it's under soil, it's being kept moist and dark, they're going to grow roots down there. So you look over to image five and you can see that underneath that mound of soil all those shoots have grown roots near the bottom. So the process of harvesting all of these new rootstock plants is to just knock all that soil away, cut the rootstock down again, and then separate each of those individual shoots with roots on it. And so now you've got a rooted new rootstock tree and you haven't had to go through any kind of uh, shock because you got it to grow roots while it was still connected to the mother plant. Um, and so down on the bottom left, you can see a couple of tubs with just those rootstocks uh, sitting in there waiting to have something grafted onto the top of them. And then in the picture on the right, uh, that's just a field of apple rootstocks there that have been mounded like that and that's a field where they're just producing rootstocks so that uh, nurseries can have plenty of stock to graft the desirable scion varieties onto. And so one of the take-home messages I want you to really get here today is that if you're only paying attention to the scion, such as, oh, I want to grow Honeycrisp apple or I really want to grow, uh, you know, 
whatever, you name it, you, whatever kind of grape or apricot or peach or cherry that you'd like to grow, you're missing part of the story, okay? You really need to pay attention to the rootstock that your scion variety is attached to. And now we could talk a little bit more about those characteristics that the rootstocks have. Okay, so here are the things that ideally we're hoping to get from a rootstock. First, the rootstock has the ability to control the growth rate and the, the ultimate size of the tree. So when we talk about dwarf trees, those are always going to be grafted. And so, for instance, you could take a cutting off of a full-sized Macintosh tree. Let's say it's 30 feet tall and 30 feet wide. Um, you could take cuttings off of that, graft them onto rootstocks that were dwarfing rootstocks. And, for instance, let's say you put it onto an M7 rootstock. That tree, even though it came off of a 30 by 30 adult Macintosh tree, it's never going to get more than about 15 by 15. You could instead graft it onto a more dwarfing rootstock, something like an M26. And then your tree, again, the offspring essentially of a 30 by 30 foot tree, once grafted onto a fully dwarfing rootstock like M26, that tree will never get more than about 10 feet tall. So that's a huge consideration there is controlling tree size. And Frankly, in the modern orchard industry, everything has moved towards either fully dwarf or semi-dwarf trees. There really are not any commercial orchards in really Western Europe or North America anymore that are growing full-size trees. It turns out that you can get a lot more productivity um, and just yield of crop out of an acre on semi-dwarf or dwarf rootstocks than you can in full-size trees. Add to that the fact that you now don't have to get on a ladder at all or so much and all of your spraying is made a lot easier and you have smaller canopies to manage so um, more productive easier to manage um, so we also another thing we're looking for from our rootstock is what we call precocity okay or precociousness and this means that the tree is going to actually start producing fruit earlier than it would if it was on a full-size rootstock um, for instance with apples on a full-size rootstock you're looking at typically year seven before you're getting any kind of a reasonable, sizable crop. With most dwarf rootstocks um, on apple, you're looking at getting your first sizable crop in year three. So that's a really big, uh, significant advantage to some of these rootstocks and, and dwarfing rootstocks in particular. Um, also, rootstocks can confer disease and insect resistance. Uh, for instance, fire blight, which is a really big concern around here, uh, also Phytophthora and Verticillium, um, as well as woolly apple aphids and nematodes. You can have, if, if, if one or more of those diseases or pests is a problem in your area, you can look for rootstocks for the particular type of tree crop that you're going to be growing that have resistance to the problem or problems that, that are most severe in your area. So that's really an important consideration there. Um, also, different rootstocks are going to have different level, levels of adaptation to different or what we sometimes politely call around here challenging soil types. Um, and so in a place like Colorado where we do have kind of calcareous and somewhat alkaline soils, um, selecting a rootstock that's going to be well adapted to those types of soils is going to be hugely important for the long term uh, and even short term success of your plantings. And also different rootstocks are going to express different adaptations to climates. So there are some rootstocks that do better in places where winter temperatures you know, never get below 20 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And there's other rootstocks that won't mind one bit uh, going to negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit during the winter. So again, you're going to want to watch and make sure you get rootstocks that are well suited to your conditions. Okay, so <clears throat> let's just talk about the dwarfing here because, you know, a lot of times you might see on a tag or you hear people toss around these terms dwarf and semi-dwarf, but let's just get down to what they actually mean. So when we're talking about a full-size tree, that's referred to as a standard, standard-sized tree. Um, a vigorous tree or a vigorous rootstock is going to produce a large tree but one that's about 80 percent of standard. Uh, Semi-vigorous is going to produce a tree that's about 60 to 70 percent of standard. Semi-dwarfs about 40 to 50 percent of standard and a full dwarf is going to re result in a adult mature tree that's about 25 percent of what it would have been on uh, standard rootstock. 
Okay, and I do want to point out, um, apple is the only crop that has rootstocks that have been developed in all of those size classes. When we get to things like peaches and plums, uh, we find that we don't really have a lot of options for dwarfing. There are some semi-dwarf and vigorous uh, rootstocks for those things, and there's actually some kind of in the development pipeline, there are some true dwarfing rootstocks coming out for plums that may also work for peaches, um, but we need probably a couple more years before we start seeing those uh, commonly. So just a picture here that I think uh, is really, uh, two pictures I guess, that are very illustrative. So these pictures were taken over at the Mauling Research Station in England. Uh, that's a rather famous place for those of us tree fruit geeks because they've done a lot of the seminal work in developing tree fruit rootstocks over there. Uh, for instance, this Mauling Research Station in England uh, was the first place to do a systematic recording and evaluation of all the various rootstocks that had been developed in Europe over the last several hundred years. Uh, around the mid 20th century, uh, they sent teams of horticulturists out all over the continent of Europe to contact local farmers and find out, oh, do you have a rootstock that you've been growing your trees on? And they basically collected material of all of those sorts, brought them back to the research station, and then evaluated them over decades. Most of them got thrown right out into the trash, but a handful of them were found to be truly superior. And that really uh, has formed the basis for not only all of the rootstocks that we grow on, but even uh, later research programs that have been developing other rootstocks generally are using those mulling selections as the basis for their breeding programs. So this picture here, again, from the mulling station, um, shows a couple of trees here. Uh, the first one on the left is a standard size apple tree on a seedling rootstock. And then the one on the right is a dwarf apple tree. Uh, to be honest, I forget the variety, but these are the same variety, these trees. And you're looking at uh, a tree on an M9 or you know a fully dwarfing rootstock. And both of those trees are the same age. And these pictures are to scale here. So what you're seeing is a much smaller tree on the M9. And very importantly, because this this becomes really important for management of dwarf trees. Notice the root system. It's healthy, it's doing what it needs to do, but it is also dwarfed, okay? And so that's gonna be an important consideration because for instance, um, you're going to wanna provide water and nutrients to your fruit trees. If you have dwarf trees, you're gonna to need to be delivering those things closer to the trunk than you would on a full-size tree that has a broader root spread. Um, furthermore, with dwarf trees, for all the benefits they come along with, there's this one downside that because of the smaller root system, they need to have some additional anchorage. So dwarf trees, you're going to wanna stake, and they generally need staking or some kind of support uh, for, the, for the duration of their life. Okay, so here's just some more comparison pictures. Uh, these are up at the University of Minnesota, and this is a relatively new cultivar that they've released up there that you'll start seeing hitting markets in the next couple years called Zestar. Uh, it's quite a good apple. Um, and so going from left to right, you can see that uh, they've got these on B9, M26, and M7. And so you can see those three different sizes all planted at the same time. They all have exactly the same scion variety on there. Uh, so this just goes to show that real difference in tree size that grafting to rootstocks can have. Okay, so I just want to run down for you uh, first some apple rootstocks and then we'll get into uh, recommended rootstocks for other fruit tree types. Um, but like I mentioned before, apple really has by far the best and widest selection. Uh, so up at the top there, the M27, 15 to 20% dwarfing, uh, meaning a very small tree that's only going to be three to four inches. It's probably better referred to as a bush. Um, so this is not going to be something, if you're planting a commercial orchard, this is not what you're going to plant. But for a really interesting novelty backyard or even patio container plant, real conversation starter, um, M27 is what you'd want to find to graft uh, your apple onto to make this bush. Um, I've had them before and they are really 
pretty neat as a little project. Um, <clears throat> they do, by the way, have full-size fruit, and I should mention that. A dwarf tree does not have dwarf fruit on it, and this goes for all of these. They have full-size fruits. Um, there are even some rootstocks which, with certain, you know, paired with certain scions, appear to even, even on a, a dwarf rootstock, produce fruit that's somewhat larger, maybe 10 to 12 percent larger than the fruits would be if produced on a full-size tree. Um, <clears throat> the next rootstock I wanted to mention here is the M9. Um, again, that's going to be a pretty small tree there at 8 foot. However, it is susceptible to fire blight. And uh, anybody who's tried to grow apples or pears or crab apples around here is probably familiar with fire blight. It's a bacterial disease. And typically, we think of it as something that attacks the canopy of the tree. Uh, first, the little twigs, and then it moves its way back into the larger limbs and eventually into the trunk. However, Fire blight can also directly infect the root stock of a plant. And uh, that can be a real problem. And because you might imagine, when you get a fire blight infection in the canopy of the tree on some small twigs, you can prune that out. And you're not going to lose the whole tree. You just manage it, and you can be OK. But if you get fire blight into the root system and into the that little couple of inches down just above the ground at that, that top part of the rootstock portion of your tree, um, it can kill the tree very quickly because, of course, it's infecting that kind of nerve center of the tree where all the, the resources have to pass through that uh, ba <clears throat> pardon me, base of the trunk. Um, so M9 is not really one that I'm going to recommend to you very highly here in Colorado where we have a lot of fire blight. Now to the rescue comes Bud 9. Uh, you'll notice that Bud 9 is going to give you about the same size tree and it has pretty strong resistance to fire blight. It's also very cold hardy. Um, so for a lot of reasons Bud 9 is a really good uh, dwarfing rootstock for apples in our state. Um, I will mention the name, so all the M's, that stands for mulling, that research station I told you about. Bud stands for Budgovsky. And so during the Cold War, of course, the United States and the Soviets were not sharing any kind of, uh, you know, agricultural tidbits and information with one another. But it turns out the Soviets were developing uh, apple rootstocks just like the British and British and the Americans were and this Bud 9 for Budgovsky 9 uh, turns out to be a really great one that was developed in the Central Asian part of the Soviet Union which if anybody's familiar has very similar soils topography and climate as we have here um, especially on the front range but in a number of areas here in the state of Colorado so Bud 9 really great choice for your fully dwarf trees um, even better, perhaps, is a really new one that came out. Is this next one called G16. The G there stands for Geneva, as in Geneva, New York. This is where the research station uh, for Cornell University's fruit breeding program is. And um, the G series is the first series that was specifically bred to be fire blight resistant. We'd seen some fire blight resistance just by good fortune in other varieties. The whole G series has very strong fire blight resistance, even better than the, the Bud, Bud 9. Um, so if you can get your hands on G16 or trees grafted onto G16, it's a very good rootstock for here. Because it is relatively new, um, production is still a little bit limited, but as the years go on, you're going to see more and more and more availability of that. Um, now the next one here, I really want to point out, and I want this to stick in your mind, M26. M26 is, without a doubt, the most common uh, dwarf apple rootstock. However, it is very susceptible to fire blight and a couple of other diseases. And so it is really not that well suited here in Colorado. Um, you know, I'll be honest, I don't want to completely scare you off. I have a number of trees that are on M26 because that's, that's how they came. And I haven't had fire blight problems with them yet, uh, but I happen to manage my trees very well. Um, by the numbers, the, the probability that you will have fire blight problems is much, much, much higher with M26 than it is with either the G16 or the Bud 9. So if you've got a choice, go with one of those, uh, the Bud 9 or the G16 for your dwarf tree. If you've already got a tree in the ground on M26, though, I just want to make sure you don't think I'm telling you to go tear those trees out. Just understand that it may, and you know, be, be prepared and, and learn how to recognize what fire blight looks like. 
Um, the next one we've got is G11. Uh, obviously, it comes from that Geneva series as well. And that's for the next step up in size. That's going to give you about a 10-foot tree at maturity. And again, it has very strong fire blight resistance. Um, <clears throat> also in the Geneva series is the G30. And that's going to give you a bit bigger tree, about 12 feet high. Again, very cold hardy, really good fire blight resistance. Um, now, M7, the next one here. Uh, this... Uh, is the rootstock that I think you could uh, honestly say that the Western Slope Apple industry was built on was this M7. It's a really good, vigorous, semi-dwarf rootstock, and it's one of the ones that just by good luck turns out to have had to have really good fire blight resistance. Um, occasionally, the, the main problem that growers complain about M7 here in Colorado is that some years they will see some root death um, and they may see a little bit of die out in the canopy after particularly severely cold winters um, but I'll just put it this way it's not a big enough problem for all those folks to get rid of their M7s they still grow most of their trees on M7 over there um, and then I just wanted to mention another variety that uh, if you want a little bit bigger tree uh, maybe for kind of a combination fruit slash shade tree in your yard. Uh, MM106 is a very good uh, larger kind of medium to large size apple tree um, <clears throat> that's pretty adaptable to soils, although it doesn't really have much in the way of fire blight resistance. Okay, so let's change gears and talk about cherry rootstocks. Um, you know, if we were talking 10 years ago, I'd have very little to share with you here except for the bottom two. But fortunately, um, there are some very busy rootstock breeders over in uh, the western, southwestern parts of Germany, and they have developed the Gisela series of rootstocks. And so uh, you see listed there Gisela 5, Gisela 12, and Gisela 6. Um, <clears throat> Gisela 5 and 6, I would say, are, are very available these days. Gisela 12, a little bit less so. Uh, but basically what you're looking at for the first time is a way to reliably dwarf cherry trees. And uh, these Gisela rootstocks can work for both sweet cherries and tart cherries. Um, now, tart cherries don't happen to be very big trees even when they grow to full size, right? It's only going to maybe be a 15 to 18 foot tall tree. Um, so a lot of people don't bother dwarfing them. Sweet cherries, on the other hand, can often attain 40 feet in height. And so that's it's much more desirable to be dwarfing those. Um, I'll be honest, I also like putting my tart cherries onto these dwarfing rootstocks. I've had a lot of really good success with Gisela 5, uh, you know, having tart cherry bushes that are only about... Um, you know, really they're about seven feet tall, which is very nice and manageable. Um, Gisela 6 is going to make a tree for you that's so probably um, a little bit taller than that, probably about 10 feet tall. Um, and then I want to mention these ones down at the bottom, Mahalib and Mazard. Um, so notice Mahalib... Um, doesn't really give you much as far as dwarfing, right? It's going to maybe take about 10% off the total ultimate size of your tree, but it is a very tough, tough root, st root system, uh, and it's tolerant of both drought and really cold conditions. And those are a couple things that we periodically encounter here in Colorado. And so Mahalib, especially for your tart cherries, where you're not looking for a lot of dwarfing, Mahalib is really, really a good choice. Um, and then further down, um, you'll see Mazard. And uh, it's a full-size tree, but it's just a really tough root system, less, less susceptible to diseases, uh, water, and temperature stresses, etc. So if you're growing sweet cherries um, and you want a full-size tree, um, it's, it's going to be a really good selection. And um, if you're growing tart cherries, which you know, generally do fine on any of these root uh, rootstocks. If you want a full-size tree and you've got particularly heavy soils that tend to stay wet, you'd want to go with Mazard because it's particularly resistant to soil-borne root fungi. Okay, uh, let's talk briefly about plum rootstocks. Um, <clears throat> like I mentioned, the plum rootstocks, these dwarfing rootstocks, are relatively new. Um, the most common that you'll see as far as a actual cloned rootstock for plums is going to be Miroblan. Uh, again, it's 100%, no dwarfing there, but it is a really good high quality rootstock that tends to be vigorous and disease resistant. Um, some uh, that have come out more recently, and you'll probably have to hunt around a little bit to find availability, would be uh, 
Pixie, which gives you a tree that's about 60% uh, of full size, uh, but it does result in slightly smaller fruit than a standard size tree will. Um, now, let's go to the flip side. Let's look at the next one down, Krimsk 1. You might guess that's another one that came out of a Russian breeding station. And that one's going to give you about a half size tree, about 8 foot for most plums. It's very cold hardy, very precocious, meaning the trees bear at a young age, and it has bigger fruit. Uh, the same variety will produce bigger fruit on a Krimsk 1 uh, rootstock than it will on its own or on a Mirobalan, for instance. Um, I have been very pleased with Krimsk 1. I've got a number of trees on that right now. Um, and Puma Select um, becoming quite a bit more popular. Notice it's going to give you a relatively small plum tree, but it's not compatible with all varieties of edible plums. Um, and so that's just one of those things. You can experiment yourself doing some grafting. I would say Puma Select for now, if you want a tree on that, I'd order it from a nursery that's already done the grafting because they've already worked out you know, what varieties will work on that Puma Select uh, rootstock. Oops, going backwards. There we go. OK, so peach rootstocks. Um, this is where we're, we're really limited, but there is literally a huge wave of research that's going to crash upon us in the next couple of years with a whole bunch of new dwarfing rootstocks, <clears throat> pardon me, for peaches. Um, there's actually some work being done looking at putting peaches onto some of those plum rootstocks that we talked about on the, on the previous page. Uh, the Krimsk 1, for instance, is showing some early uh, success as a peach, dwarfing peach rootstock. So uh, for peaches right now, the availability is going to be limited primarily to Lovell, Bailey, and Halford. Okay, uh, Lovell is the most common over in the Palisade area, but I'll tell you what, even all those Palisade uh, growers over there uh, are frustrated with Lovell and the way it performs on our higher pH soils. They are fighting iron chlorosis problems uh, regularly, and that's why some have switched to Halford, uh, because it does take up iron more effectively at the higher pHs that we have around most of our state. Um, and Bailey, if you're in a particularly cold area, uh, Bailey's going to perhaps be your best bet here in Colorado. But again, keep, keep your eyes open. Uh, some of you may be familiar with one of my colleagues, Ramesh Pokarel. He works at our Orchard Mesa Research Station over in Palisade. And he has some pretty large trials out in the field right now where he's looking at a whole bunch of new varieties of peach rootstocks, many of which are dwarfing. And he'll be evaluating those. I figure it'll be another couple of years and we'll see some really solid results coming out of Ramesh's work. Okay, and I'd like to talk about pear rootstocks here a little bit. Um, the most common rootstock for pears worldwide is the Bartlett seedling. Uh, it turns out that just the seedlings of uh, off of Bartlett pears uh, make pretty good rootstock. Um, <clears throat> there is another one out there um, that's been really the only, until the last several years, it's been the only dwarfing stock out there for for pears, and it's actually a type of quince. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, quince is a relative, a close relative, of pears and apples. Um, it makes a fruit that looks a bit like a yellowish green apple with fuzz on it, the way that a peach has fuzz. And they're not commonly eaten all that much, although they're baked with, and in Europe it's real traditional to make uh, jellies or jams. They usually call them a quince paste. Um, anyways, this Provence quince for a long time has been sold as a dwarfing rootstock for pears. However, it has really bad uh, susceptibility to fire blight and it's it's rather tender when it comes to winter temperatures. So it's really not a good choice here. Um, I've run into a number of people who have planted this one here because one, they wanted the dwarf, and two, they'd seen that it was well adapted to calcareous soils, right? Our, our high uh, calcium carbonate containing soils with the higher pH. Yes, that's true, but with the fire blight issues and the winter tenderness, it's just not a good selection for here in Colorado. Fortunately, to the rescue, uh, we've got these, these three down at the bottom, the OH crossed with F and then the accession number. And just to help decipher that, that stands for Old Home 
crossed with Farmingdale. Uh, Old Home and Farmingdale are both varieties of pears that were used as rootstocks, and there was a whole series of breeding done crossing those two varieties and then looking for even better rootstocks in their offspring. And so you can see here offspring number 97, number 333, and number 51 were the ones out of that uh, trial that turned out to be the really solid rootstocks. And now we've got some reliable dwarfing fire blight resistant rootstocks for pears. Uh, this is actually just a, a big breakthrough recently. Uh, so you can see the OHXF97 is going to give you pretty much a full size tree but with the additional cold hardiness and fire blight resistance. Um, OH XF333 is currently the one that I see the, the greatest availability on, and it's a nice, what we would call a semi-dwarfing uh, rootstock. The OHXF51 is less available because, of course, with all these new varieties, it just takes a certain number of years to build up uh, the stock in the nurseries, in these grafting nurseries around the country before um, a lot of trees become available on them, but that one is going to just make for great backyard pears and these nice small pear trees which we've just never had the option to do before. Okay, and then I wanted to show you um, a couple pictures here. This one was taken over on the west slope um, <clears throat> because uh, well, I just want to show you some of the ways that grafting and rootstocks and stuff are used to manage orchards. So this picture taken right here, um, you don't see the actual rootstock. We're looking at a, at a cutoff trunk about two feet above the ground. But the rootstock underneath here is an M7. And the apple variety that was grafted onto those M7 trees about 20 years ago was Red Delicious. Now, this is the part where I normally ask everybody to raise their hands and show me how many people in the audience love Red Delicious and think it's just the greatest apple. Guess what? I've done it enough times. I know that none of you have your hand up out there. Nobody thinks Red Delicious is the best apple out there. And, you, and as a grower, you don't get a good price for it. And it's, they can sometimes be hard to even sell. And so most growers who had a lot of Red Delicious uh, have top worked their orchards, which means chopping off the Red Delicious tree at about two feet high and then grafting on a newer, more desirable, easier to sell variety. And so this tree here has had Honeycrisp grafted onto the top. And you can see there were actually three grafts placed on there. There's the one to the left, the one to the right, and then kind of by the guy's right knee in the, in the back there, you see there was a third graft. That one didn't take. Okay, and that was one of the reasons why they put three on in the first place. They may end up selecting just one of these to be the new central leader, or they may keep both of the, the live healthy ones. But uh, I did just want to point this out too, for any of you who might want to get into grafting, even the pros don't get 100% success rate on all of their grafts. Um, <clears throat> and the yellow stuff on there is just uh, basically a latex paint uh, used to cover up all the graft areas so that they don't dry out before they have a chance to knit those tissues together. Uh, this next picture here, this is at one of the research facilities that CSU maintains over on the West Slope. And this is, again, just showing you that graft union, the spot where the scion and the rootstock come together. Um, you can see the, the, the larger diameter of the rootstock, the slightly smaller diameter of the scion. And if you look to the right hand side, you see that white oval. That is the remnant of that scar peeking at you there. Uh, so where the white oval is in that scar, initially that was where the top of the rootstock tree was and it got snipped off when the graft was made successfully. And I just want to show you another picture here. Um, notice this one that the, the rootstock is really, really swollen uh, compared to the last one we just looked at and compared to the scion on top. There is what we call uh, incompatibility. Sometimes certain varieties, uh, and this could be with apples or cherries or peaches or any kind of fruit tree, certain varieties of those fruits don't match up very well with certain rootstocks. And this is something that has not been worked out particularly well. We don't have a, a cheat sheet, if you will, that shows us every single relationship between 
every possible variety and every rootstock that it could be combined with and, and telling us which ones are incompatible. This here, if you see something like this, this is not to worry, okay? This one is showing slight incompatibility. What you will see in some cases when the, the, the graft is just totally incompatible is, you know, maybe it'll take and it'll work for the first year or two, but then pretty quickly the scion is going to grow down over the rootstock and you can almost, it, it looks almost like a, a skirt that's getting, you know, longer each year and it just drops down around the rootstock and when it touches the soil line, your scion variety will start to actually produce roots and root itself in. But we really don't want that because remember this whole process of grafting and rootstock selection, all of this was to avoid growing our fruit trees on roots that are produced by the scion variety because they're not very good root systems. So you don't want to let that happen. Um, if you do see that happening, you actually want to go in there and trim off that tissue, that skirt that's, that's moving its way down and trying to contact the soil. To be perfectly honest though, in a situation where you've got that incompatibility like that, you're probably going to want to just start planting some new trees because that tree with that incompatible graft is not going to do very well. I wanted to make you guys aware of this issue of incompatibility, but I don't want to scare you. Um, it happens in very few instances. A very small percentage of all those possible combinations result in incompatibility. <clears throat> and uh, just for a last slide, this is, you could kind of think of this as almost a trick slide because it has nothing to do, well it has some things to do with, with our rootstocks here. This is a peach tree and some of you may recognize this picture. It's actually a really good picture of Cytospora canker on peach trees. And this picture was taken in those research blocks that I was mentioning that Ramesh Pokharel runs out at the Palisade Research Station. Um, and this was just an indication, one of those rootstocks that he's testing, pretty much every tree gets this Cytospora canker in its first year or two, and they all end up dying within about five years. So that's the kind of thing we're looking for. Obviously, that rootstock, you know what's going to happen to it. It's going to get yanked and burned <laughs> and removed from the trial. But that's the kind of stuff we learn. And it just goes to show, again, the wrong rootstock can get you landed in all kinds of disease problems. The right rootstock, perhaps more importantly, with the right rootstock, you can avoid uh, susceptibility to a lot of diseases. Okay, so that's uh, the end of the slides that I have prepared. Um, I do just want to mention uh, that I'm going to be putting on a two-day fruit growing symposium in February, and one part of that, uh, on the second day in the afternoon, uh, I'm going to be running a grafting workshop. And so we're gonna, I'm going to basically teach a little session on the actual uh, hands-on approach of how you do grafting in a couple of different ways. And then I, am I will have ordered in a whole bunch of rootstocks and a whole bunch of scion material. And so uh, those who attend this workshop can actually make their own new grafted fruit trees there that day. Uh, we've got greenhouse space to keep them in because they won't love going right outside in the end of February. So we'll keep them in a greenhouse for you for a couple of months. And then in early or mid-April, you'll be able to come pick up your own tree that you grafted yourself. And just to get kind of corny on you for a moment, I got to tell you, I think most of us as gardeners understand that feeling of kind of ownership or almost uh, parenthood uh, with plants that, especially if we've grown them from seed or we've propagated the plant ourselves and planted it and watched it grow. And there is something definitely special about watching a tree that you've grafted grow and give you fruit year and year out. So um, I'd really encourage any of you who are interested to register for that. Um, so with that, uh, we've got a couple minutes before one o'clock and I think Jennifer is going to want to take some poll questions and then I'll get into answering all of your questions. Thanks Joel. Um, Joel's correct. I wanted to go ahead and get some poll, poll results before you start logging off. So just to show um, if you've learned anything new today, and hopefully many of you have. Ooh, look at that. You learned, you learned a lot. <laughs> Wonderful. And I also wanted to just point out that on September 21st, Joel's going to do another webinar on stone fruits for Colorado below 7,000 feet. So you can register for that one as well, and hopefully you'll be able to join us. Yeah, and maybe I'll actually put together a 
a grape growing webinar here soon. I don't know if you guys can really see it. This is a variety called Mars. Uh, I've been growing them in my front yard for a number of years now. Really great seedless red grape. Uh, but there's a bunch of other really delicious grapes we can grow around here. Uh, not so many great wine grapes, but lots of great table grapes for eating and for raisin making. Wine grapes for the West Slope. Wine grapes for the West Slope. And, and there are wine grapes we can grow on the East Slope here. I just don't think they happen to make particularly good wine. Um, but you're welcome to argue with me about that. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's see. We're going to scroll through our questions and get right on to those. Um, okay, so first question is, do I have any tips on recognizing fire blight in the root or the trunk? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, you know, honestly, the best thing I think you could do is go to Google and do an image search. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, when you go to the Google homepage, uh, up near the upper margin, near the left, you will see the word images. Click on that, and it will just search only images online, and just put in the search terms, fire blight on Apple rootstock and you'll get a whole bunch of images. I've done that search myself. I, I know what you'll find. Um, the, the main way is you're going to see uh, the bark uh, starting to sink, get little sunken lesions, and then if you were to peel a little bit of that bark back, maybe with a paring knife or something, you'd see that the vascular layer underneath the bark is discolored, uh, often in kind of real streaky patterns. You're going to have browns and kind of brownie orange type colors in that vascular layer. Um, Next question, uh, are there any varieties of fruit trees that will do well above 7,500 feet? Um, reliably, not really. Um, there are, you know, I think if you're willing to set your expectations such that you only anticipate getting fruit every several years, then I think the ones that you would be most likely to have success with would be probably tart cherries. Um, uh, because they bloom relatively late and uh, ripen up in a relatively short season. Um, you might also try certain plums like the Italian prune plum. But again, um, I would stay away from Japanese plums or Japanese American hybrid plums. Stick with uh, maybe a couple European type plums and tart cherries. Other than that, I just think your success rate is going to be really down. That said, of course, there's little microclimates here and there. I definitely know of people who have apple trees that produce for them at least every few years up at around the 7,500 foot level. It's just, as far as a recommendation, I just don't have a lot of uh, info to share with you there. It's a little bit hit or miss. Um, okay, the next question. When you refer to cold hardy and very cold hardy varieties, what zone slash temps are you referring to? Uh, good question. And of course, um, you know, in a way I know better, right? That word hardy, what the heck does it really tell us? Um, but when I say very cold hardy for a rootstock, typically we're, we're talking about something that's not going to have any significant problems getting a midwinter low temperature down into the, you know, negative 25 area, negative 30 even. Um, <clears throat> for cold hardy, we're looking at things that are probably happy enough in the negative 15 to negative 20 range, but you might start seeing some root death uh, past that. And of course, a little bit of root death doesn't mean death of the tree necessarily. It just means that the tree may have a little bit of setback. It may not uh, leaf out in the spring as fast and as vigorously as you'd hope for. Okay. Oh, and, and I want to get back to the last question about uh, trees at 7,500 feet. Are there any ways to keep Yogi Bear away? Um, you know, there, there are ways, but I'll just be perfectly honest here. Um, it's tough. It's tough to exclude bears. And I'm glad you actually asked the question because on one sense, I think we should talk ethics a little bit about planting fruits up at high elevation in our, in our wild areas because, you know, I think you can tell I love fruits. But I also love wildlife, I love bears, and I think we all know the story of what happens when a bear starts becoming a quote-unquote problem bear because it's messing with human property and stuff. The bear gets put down. And so in a way, it almost seems like trickery to, I mean, we know the nature of the, these bears, we know that they're going to be attracted to our fruit crops. And so if you go planting those in an area where you have, you know, bear activity, pretty likely you're going to have bears on your property eating your fruit and you know I think you need to 
to really consider those impacts and is it worth it to try to eke out fruit sometimes at high elevation or would it be better to maybe pair with a friend who you have who lives down on the, the plains part of our state and put some trees in on their property and you know let the bears keep foraging for uh, choke cherries and the other wild stuff that's maybe not in your yard. Okay, um, next question here, and I'm going to kind of refer this one to Jennifer, I think. Can a transcript of this webinar be made available? Um, I think at this point, we don't really have time <laughs> to be able to do something like that. However, all these webinars are recorded and available on the Small Acreage Management website, so in that way, you can watch them as many times as you need to to get, to get all the information. Yeah, so they'll be available as video. Although, if you want to uh, offer your services as a transcriptionist, uh, please go ahead and get in touch with us, and you're welcome to transcribe all of these webinars. Absolutely. We'll take volunteers. <laughs> um, okay, uh, next question here is, do any rootstocks provide resistance to peach tree borer? Great question. Um, not really, no. Um, there has certainly not been any, any research so far to indicate that any peach rootstocks are less or more susceptible to peach tree borer. Um, the next tree, how reasonable is it to grow dwarf fruit trees in a greenhouse? Uh, any special considerations or recommendations? Um, yeah, a really good question. Um, it's absolutely reasonable and viable to grow uh, dwarf fruit trees in a greenhouse. As a matter of fact, uh, cherries, sweet cherries in particular, I would say are the tree fruit crop that has been, uh, there's been the most uh, development in growing dwarf trees under high tunnels usually. Usually it's not a full proper greenhouse, which would be a four season heated and cooled uh, space, but a, but a high tunnel that's more of a three season structure. The reason being the following, cherries, I mean one, they're a very high value crop, two, um, one of the biggest concerns and challenges in growing sweet cherries is cracking of the cherries. Um, and when a, a cherry splits, it tends to rot after that, and it can really ruin a grower's profits. Um, and the splitting typically happens when there is a rain event that happens in the last two to three weeks before the cherries would be harvested. So they're already pretty big, and then when the soil gets an inundation of water, the roots take that up, they pump it into the cherries, and boom, it splits them open. So being able to control uh, and, and get rid of the vagaries of the weather for those cherry crops is really important. And so a lot of cherries are now being grown on dwarf stock, especially that Gisela 5 and 6. Under these high tunnels, they are typically trellised. And if you want to look at, uh, search something online for kind of a real state-of-the-art introduction to how this is being done, you want to search on the Google terms cherry UFO, as in unidentified flying object, um, but in this case it refers to upright fruiting something or other. But it's a particular system that I believe was developed at Washington State University for growing sweet cherries in high tunnels. Uh, it's really, really become very common in Great Britain now. Uh, but you can grow other trees uh, in greenhouses. One thing to keep in mind though, if you're using a greenhouse, um, all of these fruit trees must have winter chill. We call it chill hours. So you're going to need to let it get cold in that greenhouse so that the trees have a proper dormant season. Uh, I won't get into the whole physiology lesson, but suffice it to say, if a tree doesn't get adequate chill hours in the winter, it will not put on any crop or maybe just a very light crop the following year. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, next question. When using a disease-resistant rootstock, how important is the resistance of the scion? That's a great question. So, um, <clears throat> so I mentioned uh, fire blight, okay? Very common around here. Fire blight is a bacterium and it's an airborne pathogen. So uh, the fire blight can hit either the canopy, so the scion variety, or the base of the rootstock there. I guess I should say the top of the rootstock. So in that case, it's really important to have a resistant rootstock and resistant scion variety. Now, let's take another look. Uh, Phytophthora is a soil-borne fungal pathogen. It's going to infect 
the roots of a, of a plant, it doesn't have any way of infecting or at least starting an infection through the canopy. So in that case, you wouldn't need to worry so much about a scion variety that had resistance to Phytophthora, but you would want a rootstock. Uh, and vice versa for other diseases that might only come in through the canopy, but not through the roots. So it really depends on what that disease, what kind of tissues that disease can impact. Um, okay, the next uh, question here. Will this PowerPoint presentation be sent to us? Um, I don't think it's going to be sent to you, but you can always go to Jennifer's website, and I'm just going to refer to Jennifer here for the details because we've got yeah. all of these things. Uh, they are all backed up and saved and available for you to watch free 24-7 on Jennifer's website. Also, I'll point out on my CSU Extension website, we're also linking to this part of Jennifer's site. So there's a couple places you can find them. So Jennifer? Yeah, Ruth, do you want to type, type up the address? It's www. Oh, did you already do oh, it? Oh, look at that. Oh, thank you. So in the text box, uh, very last comment says Joel Reich 2. That is the address uh, to go check out all of the recorded sessions. So, of course, today's session will be there and all of the previous webinars that I've done on fruits. Yep, and if you just look on the right column, there's a section called recorded and if you go to archived webinars they're all listed um, for the past three years that we've been doing them yeah there's a lot of great ones on there that I didn't do lots of other <laughs> topics that have been addressed um, next question here what would be a good rootstock for apricot trees oh yes I didn't mention that did I uh, for a very good reason there really are not any apricot rootstocks um, again because apricots are so closely related to peaches and cherries and plums, um, what's being done now is people are looking at whether some of those dwarfing stocks for plums in particular will be acceptable to apricot scion wood. Um, right now though, there just isn't anything. Apricots are all full-size trees and uh, trust me, I'll be as excited as anybody when we start having the ability to dwarf some apricot trees. Um, let's see, next question. We have an apple orchard that is 100 years old. Congratulations. Uh, when do Red Delicious and Jonathan apple trees need to be replaced because of old age? Um, well, here's the deal. Typically, a tree in a, a productive orchard type setting, uh, the, the productive life is going to be different based on the, the species of tree. Apples generally are not kept for more than about 50 years or so. Um, that's not to say they cannot be productive at 100 years old. I, I would suspect that about 100 years old, you're starting to see some disease issues and some reduced productivity, maybe smaller fruit size. A lot of that can be kind of mitigated with good pruning and fertility management. Um, but uh, another way to think about this, I was just seeing this in a best practices guide for commercial apple growers, is that every year you should be replanting 10 to 15 percent of your orchards. Okay, and I know that sounds like a lot, but the idea is to keep all of your trees relatively young. Ages, you know, 5 to 20 are going to be the peak bearing years for apples. And so one reason is to not let the trees get super old. The other reason is that having success growing an orchard has everything to do with whether you can sell the apples, how easily you can sell them, and most importantly, what price you can get for them. And so a reason, you know, besides plant health to replace those trees earlier would be marketing and, and increased profits because for your Red Delicious, you're not going to get very much. I mean, as a commercial sale, you're probably looking at 28 to 35 cents a pound uh, for those Red Delicious, whereas commercially you could be getting closer to $2 a pound for something like Honeycrisp that's much more popular these days. So uh, a lot of reasons to consider. One thing to keep in mind is if the trees are generally healthy, if the root systems are generally healthy, you might want to top work your orchard, the way that I, I illustrated in that one picture with the yellow uh, schmutz all over the top of the, the uh, grafting site there, um, because that's going to save you some time. Because if you've got a healthy root system that's been established for a long time and you stick a couple scions on the top of it, uh, there's a lot of root system energy there to support a relatively small tree. So that tree is going to grow very fast and you're going to get to good productivity faster than you would if you just planted a new tree. Now, that said, of course, 
there's advantages because your 100 year old orchard we can guarantee is not on any kind of specialty rootstocks and they're not on dwarf rootstocks. So you might want to switch over and start planting new trees on rootstocks, but you might want to top work some of those trees just so that uh, you don't lose too much productivity in the, in the intervening years while your new dwarf trees are coming into fruit. Um, so your rootstock can never be too old? Jennifer's question was, your rootstock, can your rootstock really never be too old? And um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's generally true as long as it is healthy. Right. The reality is the older the root system gets, the more likely it's going to get some kind of disease. But if it's healthy, I've seen, I've seen orchards that were on uh, 50 and 60 year old roots just top worked and have another good 20 years um, of production come out of them. So definitely can be done. Um, so next question is, is it helpful to graft using rootstock of very old trees by sawing them off two feet above ground? Gotcha. I think that's kind of referring to um, what we were just talking about. Yeah, that question came from the same person. So I think I kind of covered that. So yes, it can be very helpful, just like the example I showed in the presentation of that Red Delicious Orchard being switched over to Honeycrisp. Uh, absolutely. It's just a question of, do you want to be moving towards dwarf trees, in which case, Maybe each year you should be top working some of your existing old trees and then adding in uh, or replacing some of them with some new dwarf trees. And uh, let me see, next question. What are your recommendations for growing dwarf to semi-dwarf apples on the plains in the Peyton Callahan area? Um, I'll be honest, I'm not familiar with where Peyton Callahan is. I think, is it Callahan in uh, Elbert County, I believe? Okay, so, um, you know, generally I think things, and, and really what I'd say is go and watch the Apples webinar that we've got recorded on that site because that was oh, El Paso. a couple weeks ago. Okay, El Paso County, so the east part of El Paso County. Yeah, I'd say watch the, uh, watch the webinar that's recorded on just Apples because that's going to give you recommendations on the varieties that are gonna, you're going to have the most success with and just other management practices. And then if you've got follow-up questions, you can always get in touch with me. Um, my email address is j-r-e-i-c-h at bouldercounty.org and Ruth is going to type that in so that you can all see that right there. So yeah, you're always welcome to um, <clears throat> follow up with questions with me. And where can you buy trees with specified rootstocks? Great question. Thanks for prompting me to talk about that a little bit. So um, many, many nurseries online that you would purchase from online are going to have uh, rootstock, you know, specific rootstock selections available to you. One of my beefs with a lot of local nurseries, and this is not just here in Colorado, but all over the place, is they'll sell fruit trees. And if you're lucky, it will tell you if the tree is semi-dwarf or dwarf or full size. But almost never at most of those retail centers are they actually telling you which rootstock the tree is on. And so any of you who've watched my other presentations know that I'm a big fan of mail ordering dormant bare root trees. And this is what I'd suggest you do with, with apples or any of these other trees. Um, some nurseries that you will find uh, that I have found are, are really good um, and of course this is not an official endorsement by CSU just a, a reporting of my experiences. Um, Grandpa's Orchard which is in Coloma, Michigan and they have a good website. Uh, it sounds very quaint but it's actually just the retail wing of a very large commercial fruit tree nursery. They've got a lot and they're very good about specifying the rootstocks. Um, another site would be Cummins Nursery. They're uh, located in Trumansburg, New York, and uh, that's actually run by the, uh, the fellow who developed those Geneva rootstocks when he was working as a professor at Cornell. And so certainly for those Geneva rootstocks, Cummins these days has the best and broadest selection of apples on the Geneva series. Um, also, you might want to check Rain Tree Nursery. Uh, they're out in Morton, Washington. Uh, Rain Tree is actually one of the places that I like to buy just plain old rootstocks from uh, because, you know, for instance, this workshop I talked about, um, I'm going to order a whole bunch of variously dwarfing rootstocks and we'll have a bunch of scions. That's where I'm going to get those rootstocks from, is partly from uh, Rain Tree Nursery and partly from Cummins Nursery, the one that I just mentioned. And then you might also want to check Stark Brothers Nursery. They're big, they've been around a long time, and they produce pretty good quality material and definitely going to let you know what rootstock all of their trees are available on. Um, let's see, 
And I think, oh, sorry about that. One more question. Is there a list somewhere of rootstocks and their disease resistance and or cyan varieties and their disease resistance? Hmm. Um, I'm sure there is somewhere. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where to send you. Believe it or not, uh, the Wikipedia entry for uh, apples, uh, and uh, I think, I'm not sure if there's a separate entry for apple rootstocks, but I know for apples and pears, they have actually quite good and pretty comprehensive information on Wikipedia uh, for those types of uh, fruits. And, you know, as far as disease resistance, I would check. Uh, the websites of a couple of the extension services from the states that have big apple industries. So specifically, I would send you the Washington State University Extension, uh, Michigan State University Extension, and Cornell University Extension, because I think those are going to be your best chances to find that kind of information you're looking for. And last question, uh, will these nurseries ship peach rootstocks into Colorado? It's a really good question. Uh, sometimes you'll find that, uh, for instance, if you live in a state where there's uh, an important fruit industry, certain nurseries aren't allowed uh, to send tree material, uh, plant material, into your state because of quarantine issues over concerns of introducing new pests or diseases. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't had a problem getting them before. Often I will specify, uh, if anybody does have a concern, I will specify, in my case, I'm on the east side of the mountains, and this is not where our commercial industry is, and since that's what's, you know, what they're trying to protect by using those quarantines, uh, a lot of times that'll make the difference to people because the Rocky Mountains are a really good natural barrier to diseases and pests moving over. Of course, don't mention that to the mountain pine beetle, right? They, <laughs> they, they just moved right over those mountains. Um, Okay, well, I don't see any more uh, questions coming in. I saw some nice comments. Uh, thanks for, for those. I appreciate uh, all the feedback. Um, and I uh, hope to see most of you in a couple weeks for the uh, stone fruit webinar I'll be doing on September 21st. So same bat channel, same bat time. Okay. And, uh, and then, of course, if you're interested in information about this two-day Front Range Fruit Growing Symposium I'm putting on in February, uh, just shoot me an email and I'd be happy to give you all the, the intel regarding that. Um, have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everyone.